Hello everybody, this is Dr. Weber. Uh, we're going to go over some lab videos from the I Can Do It program at UNCW and we're going to be talking about different adapted physical activities, progressions, regressions. We're going to talk about the affective, cognitive, and psychomotor domains and um, also what types of adaptations we can make or create um, based on these videos. So this is the I Can Do It you can do a program presented by UNCW 2010-2011. So I became a peer mentor in 2010 as a, um, a recent college grad in the K-12 licensure program at UNCW. And then I, uh, that's when I got my master's degree and in 2012 started teaching courses at UNCW part-time. And up until then I've been uh, there uh, almost 10 years and I've been full-time for about three now. So we're going to go back in time, show you where it all started, and then talk you through some of the physical activities, uh, the progressions and regressions, and the assessments. So this is the I Can Do It program. Uh, this was the original kind of founding members. This is a group of students from that year. Uh, in 2009, 2010, these are some of the recent grads. Some of them on this front row were in the uh, I Can Do It program. <clears throat> so my brother made this video and this is one of my first students that I ever got to work with uh, in PED 415. Uh, he was my mentee and we went to uh, Hoggart High School and we worked out there together and there was one other individual and we used all the uh, weight room equipment. He was very flexible, as you can see. Um, he was uh, definitely individuals with Down syndrome will have that um, hyper flexibility and um, hyper mobility. So uh, that is common and he has his spoon there. So he has also has autism spectrum disorder. Uh, which means that he has repetitive or restrictive behaviors and in his case that is uh, that you he loves to have his spoon so if you take his spoon from him that means that he's in trouble and that in order for him to be um, to get his spoon back he has to behave well and so um, some individuals have certain um, reinforcers it could be uh, food it could be objects uh, it could be something that they chew on uh, individuals with autism are are typically uh, uh, not all not all individuals are typically uh, have these behaviors, but the more severe and moderate cases will. So this is a nutrition poster I created as a teacher, um, and I kind of helped me. I teach individuals with disabilities because of the clear pictures, the art, and kind of, you know, I brush my teeth before bed, at dawn, after I eat, um, happy, healthy choices. So we're talking about um, working out and different fruits and vegetables. And then I wash my hands before I eat, after I use the bathroom, when they are dirty. So I'm just kind of like a happy, healthy choices poster for individuals with disabilities. So here I am kind of just going over happy, healthy choices with my, with my students and just kind of making it basic and simple enough for them to comprehend. Because uh, some of them won't be able to have back and forth com communication with you. So you have to be able to just uh, use uh, simple languages, simple words, and they can understand those a little bit better than talking about the actual carbohydrate or glucose content, right? So this is a roller coaster, or this is a, I guess, a, a, a dance. Um, what am I thinking here? This is, you can you call this a roller coaster, right? So you put your hands on each other's shoulders. If someone's in a wheelchair, they can be leading it. Um, and then whoever's behind them can help them steer, or that individual can uh, make the movements for the class. So I like this game because um, you can do it as a train standing, you can do it on the ground, and we'll get into that a little bit later. OK, 
Okay, so that's some dancing that we have going on, and that's in the step aerobics room. That's like right above our Hanover gym. And then we get into the gym setting. Here's us, uh, I think this is a Olympics where we're giving them prizes and we're having award ceremonies and they're kind of, they have different objectives, different games that they have to play. This one's kind of like So we kind of celebrated it like a Olympic game. And then here's some other things. We use the classrooms a lot. So we'd be in 119, we'd be in 143, we'd be doing step aerobics in there. We did some softball tossing. Um, we went outside to the Hoggard lawn and we did activity, we do activities out there as well with our mentees. Uh, we do dancing out there, we do soccer out there, we do a lot of different activities out there. Here's some balancing activities with uh, one of our mentees. And here's us running on the grass. And then here's a, a picture of us right on the Hoggers lawn. This is in 2010, this is when it all started. So this is the original I can do it group on Saturdays. And then we also had lab on Wednesday and Friday at that time. And then we ended up um, having five different labs. So Next, what I'll show you is um, the next year. I think this is in 2000. Uh, no, I think this is in 2012, so maybe a couple of years later. This is Ann Hughes. She's our adaptive physical education teacher here in Neonatal County. And this is our you know, first group of mentees on Saturday. So we had labs on Wednesday, Friday, like I told you, and then we also had a Saturday class. So we had about um, 10 to 15 people in 2012. We had like five to 10 people in 2010. Now we have about 30 people that will come to the Hanover gym any given Saturday when we have face-to-face -face classes. So this is when it all began. And then after we talk about I can do it, we'll get into some of the lab videos as well. So here we are doing the pacer test. So the PACER test is a assessment for the cardio uh, respiratory or cardiovascular state, right? So an assessment for um, your aerobic capacity. So it's an aerobic capacity test. How many laps can you get in a certain time or under a certain time here? So as you see, they have PACERs, which means that you run and then you stop and then you wait and then you run again. And then, I, and then the, um, the rest become less and less over time. So you have, it starts you off as pacing. That's why it's called the pacer test. It's one of the best fitness tests in the K through 12 settings for uh, testing aerobic capacity beside the mile. Okay, so we had you know, the same participants came most of the weeks. Um, we did a lot of fun, different activities. This is... Uh, oh, this monster ball. So they have to get the objects, go back to their line, and then watch what happens next. And then they're gonna play this game. I like to call it monster ball, but we'll see. So they're trying to, they're trying to hit the ball all the way to the other side. So this is a fun game for, you know, uh, throwing skills. Obviously throwing at a uh, target is a uh, standard in PE that we use. And so this would be a good way to teach it for individuals with disabilities because of the bigger ball and because of the lighter objects to throw. As you see, some, some students weren't uh, participating or they weren't actually watching. So what this indi individual here um, has a lower eyesight. So he's unable to really see and he needs a lot of direction so that's why he's kind of you know not looking right now so notice that they had to do a little physical cueing with the hands and then watch how they kind of physical cue them towards 
So that type of cueing right there, we call that physical cueing or tactile cueing. And that type of cueing uh, for some individuals with moderate or severe disabilities need that type of sensory contact in order for them to participate. Otherwise, they might just wait for you the entire time. So that's why you kind of have to be proactive. And with these games, you have to be patient. And you know, uh, if you're playing with high school students who are um, a little bit more physically advanced or aren't in adaptive PE, you'll notice that it, the game's gonna go a lot faster. There's gonna, it's gonna be a little bit, um, the ball is gonna hit the object a little bit more, but you just have to be patient. So a lot of times you, as a teacher, you just have to be very uh, motivating the entire time. Okay, so that's an example of our first kind of program and use she helped a lot and really helped me the most okay here's an example of our lab practicum on friday in about i think this is 2014 i believe and this is what a uh, class looked like then so here we're doing a three minute step test and we're uh, first taking their resting heart rate. So we have them sit down for five minutes and then we take their resting heart rate and then we have them step for three minutes, take their active rate, heart rate, and then we take their recovery heart rate a minute after that. And this is called three minute step test. And this lets us know how well their heart recovers after stepping for three minutes. You can also adapt this by using a bike or a dance. Okay, so you have some students who uh, might be doing a, uh, a lap test. So how many laps can you do in 10 minutes? How many laps can you do in five minutes? It's adapted to the individual. And it could also be how long does it take you to get a mile? So I think if you go around that 20 times or 22 times, because at the volleyball court, the white lines, we kind of measure that out. And then if you get like 22 laps or something, that's a mile. So we kind of measure out miles, we do three minute step tests. And this is typically the first day of lab. So the first day of lab, um, we typically like to assess, obviously we want to know what their resting heart rate is, their active heart rate is, and the recovery heart rate is. You saw one student's heart rate, which was at 154. Uh, that would be relatively high for a step test. Uh, depending on the individual. So that would be something that we would want to maybe in, uh, perhaps uh, uh, increase over time the cardiovascular health of that individual. So we might do more cardiovascular exercises or we might look at the weight. So we're trying to assess and make sure that we're making the right objective measures in lab. That way when we start planning for these individuals or adapting for these individuals, we know what to do. And we're gonna keep going here. Okay, you have one individual here who has um, a little cerebral palsy um, and uh, intellectual disability. And you have two individuals working with her, really making sure that she uh, doesn't fall, stays balanced, and I'm giving her lots of verbal cueing, physical cueing, and, and those tactile prompts needed and necessary to be included in the physical education classroom. Otherwise, if they were in a general PE class, they would be left behind other, unless they had a partner in the class that was helping them. Okay, next is the curl up. Now curl up isn't going to be your best measure of core strength, but it is a measure we use. So we see how many sit-ups they can do in a minute. Uh, you can do the metronome to keep them on track so they're not going too fast. 
Um, for me, I would definitely test probably more of a forearm plank core strength uh, before a sit up uh, nowadays, but we did use to uh, use the TGMD and the um, fitness gram. So a lot, if you're familiar with fitness gram testing in, in high school, we did a lot of fitness gram testing. We still do that a lot. It's a good quick measurement um, to see how much core strength they have. So it's, it's not necessarily the best measurement, but it's a good quick assessment. So each mentor has a mentee. Some mentors have two, three, or four mentees at some time. Sometimes we've had classes with only eight mentors and 20 mentees. So it just depends on your lab day. Every lab was different every, um, every year. So we, were, we had up to five labs, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday lab at one point. Now we're only down to three. So this was our Friday lab. Okay, I'm gonna go into another video now. Okay, this is our, our Wednesday lab from 2015, I believe. This is a nutrition station set up where we are using scooters, hula hoops, where you have fruit and vegetables, and we have baskets. And we have some prompt or lesson planning objectives for them to do, such as you, you know, create a healthy plate. So let's go ahead and create a healthy plate. So maybe you grab some chicken, you grab some vegetables, you grab some, um, you know, maybe some healthy uh, salads or something like that. So kind of putting together a plate. And this is also an opportunity for people to connect and socialize, get to know each other, and then also teach uh, in these specific moments, you know, why is it important to eat healthy? So the scooters are great because you're using lower body strength and core strength to keep your body stabilized. Lots of hamstrings here, uh, lots of core strength. So here's our pool. You know, obviously we have a, a lab which has a pool only, which is Tuesday. So if you're in the Tuesday lab, you would have been in the pool. Here's some experiences from up there. Okay, we do have students who use feeding tubes and have severe disabilities uh, and who need to be lowered, as you saw in that one video, into uh, big carrier inflations. So the difference between this one and the other one is that this one, he's on his back or in the horizontal plane. The other one, he's in the vertical plane. We want them to be in the vertical plane. We want to use this less and we want to use the other one more because we want to give them a chance to feel what it's like uh, to be uh, vertical because they're always horizontal. Okay, this is a good um, application of modeling. So just standing in front of a student and just having them model you. So that's a good way to teach some individuals and a lot of individuals like that kinesthetic learners like to see and move and do all at the same time, as opposed to, hey, we're gonna do this. Now I want you to go do that. So instead of doing that, maybe you're just modeling it. So this is a good example of an individual more than moderate severe end of autism spectrum disorder who needs a lot of cueing and needs a lot of uh, reinforcement. And I love how she's counting too. Uh, counting matters. I mean, talking matters. If you're if you're quiet, it doesn't help when you're working with someone who's who needs that because you can see that she's repeating the numbers. Okay, we did a little boxing. I'm not gonna say this is the best form or technique, but hey, they're having a good time. They're learning something new. They're both getting familiar with something. But, you know, we use boxing, we use the med balls, uh, we use uh, you know, lots of different techniques to use for pull-ups here. So that's the horizontal row.
So here's an example of a student leading the class, a game that they've learned before. And so you want to give your students opportunities to teach. And so I always love it when my students, you teach your students, right? Instead of me teaching everyone, because I feel like if I do that the entire year, you know, everyone could definitely get bored of that. So that's why you got to have that variety of who's teaching and, and making sure that you're kind of switching it up. Here's an example of a, a student with a disability teaching individuals with disabilities a roller coaster game. Okay, so that's uh, from a couple of years ago. So these are actually from 2015. These are uh, stu two students who I've known for the past, I think five or six years now. Uh, this is back in 2015. Okay, so here I am kind of just cognitively assessing them. So these would be the questions. These would be the assessments on my lesson plan. And these are intentive, right? You want to know what they learn and you want them to understand that they're learning. Otherwise, no learning occurs. So it's that self, um, uh, self, uh, I guess, noticing or self assessment of yourself, knowing that you know the teacher's answers or questions. So. These kids are definitely a little bit older now, but I'm here uh, assessing them after, after the lesson. Okay, so that's a cool video there. All right, so next we have, let's see here. <clears throat> so this is in 2015. This is, again, is I Can Do It. Um, this is kind of where we're at then. I'm just kind of showing you uh, some of the stations that we have set up. We have some bowling stations. Uh, we, it looks like we have a softball station here set up. Going through, it looks like we have this individual using a uh, bike. Maybe if we can find some videos more of her. So here's um, her mentor kind of working with her on the exercise ball, getting her out of the wheelchair. Okay, doing a little bit of dance. So um, the individuals with more severe um, cerebral palsy, the severe intellectual disability. Um, these are the individuals that are going to have to physically move in and out of their chair for them. You're going to have to physically um, prompt them for most exercises, like meaning tapping them on their shin when you want them to kick or moving their arm or um, trying to get some eye gaze, that, that type of thing. Okay, so this individual is just having a good time. You know, he's holding on, obviously, so he's using his gripping skills here. So that would be an essential standard. Also, he's a little bit of core strength and he's getting his legs extended. Maybe typically he is usually seated, noticing that his feet go out. So he's got external hip rotation uh, and that might be some, uh, that might cause some issues down the line with his knees, okay? so. That might be some initial assessments I might make for this individual and obviously he's got um, glasses on so he might have a visual impairment and most people who have glasses have visual impairments because that's what glasses are for. And so if you're not wearing glasses, you might not be able to see in his in his case, um, he has some major um, uh, eye um, challenges 
that affect his ability to see. So he needs a lot of physical prompting. And, um, you know, he needs to have a lot of fun in his case. So some individuals aren't going to learn unless they're having fun. So if they don't want to partake in the exercise, they might not want to. So sometimes you have to spice it up. Okay, so here's, here's an individual um, with a severe to moderate disabilities, uh, intellectual disability and um, cerebral palsy. So here we're trying to pick this individual up, put them into their bike. Okay, so we got her in the bike eventually, and then here we are having uh, this individual kick the ball into the net. You notice how she's touching the leg, a little physical cue. Okay, you know, you need a lot of support for individuals with severe disabilities. So you have to be more than verbal. You have to be enthusiastic. You have to be excited because if you're not, then you can't do this. This isn't the type of work for people who can't come out of their shell because over time, if that were to occur, this individual might not get what they need. So it's really important to kind of step out of your shell uh, in lab or in this setting um, when you're working with people with disabilities. And we challenge our individuals. So depending on the individual, we have progressions and regressions. And here's an example of different scenarios where the individual could use the stepper individual could use the step ladder, the individual could step over the, um, the hurdles. So we have different options. So progressions and regressions like we talked about for the, um, the pacer test, option to use a st uh, stepper, they could use a bike, and then here are some options for agility. A lot of individuals with autism love to jump, trampolines are a great idea these never ended up working out we only they only lasted for about a year they didn't last long you need to probably get some better trampolines but we did use them for a semester and they were they were good while they lasted so here's our tricycle we have two of these one is for the arms so the arms controls the bike and then one is for the legs and these bikes have been with us for a while. They cost over a couple, they cost over 2000. And so we've had to get grants for these bikes, but they've been saviors for our people with severe disabilities or people that utilize wheelchairs. As you see, she's helping clean up because she's my big helper. And she also helps me with the juice at the end of the lesson. I'm not sure if we can get there yet. I think it'll be in the next video. So for a typical soccer unit, you want to teach, you know, lead up skills, you know, how to pass, how to shoot, how to dribble. And then you allow individuals to play the game, right? So here's an example of us uh, playing soccer in the gym with, with pennies. Okay, so here's the coach trying to like help them out. Teams are getting ready. OK, 
Okay, now soccer, it's not the easiest to teach. So, you know, you think playing the game is going to be the easy part. It's actually the hardest part because you have to make sure the ball stays on the ground. You know, people can get injured pretty quick if they get overexcited. <laughs> there's a, there's a, you know, you just have to be careful when you play these games, but this is an example of what we might do for some individuals that are more advanced. These individuals also might be individuals that will play in the Special Olympics. Here's an exa another example of our Saturday program. So as you see, we had the gym, we were able to obviously move in space, and this is what we typically did on a given lab. We played locomotor freeze games, dance games uh, as a warm up. Okay, here's an example of sharks and minnows. Okay, this is partner flag tag. So you're trying to get your partner's flag. So this is group circle flag tag. They get into a circle and then you have one person on the outside of the circle who's trying to chase the one person with the flag. And of course, the parachute. So this is shark attack. People go underneath the parachute and then they crawl underneath and try to tag someone's shoe. Okay, and we always love to end with dance as well as warm up with it. If you remember the mannequin challenge, we definitely did that. So we let everyone choose their favorite um, piece of equipment.
you might have to look up Mannequin Challenge if you haven't seen it before. This is an example of taking the program out into a gym. This is at Matt Skelly Training, where I started uh, Transport Fitness at, and this is where individuals with disabilities are teaching the class. Okay, so that's an example of we have an individual teaching dance. Now this individual here is teaching fitness. And here's a teacher teaching yoga. meditation here. So this started off as a small so this started off as a small group but ended up with a lot more people and we this ended up being or lasting about four years. Um, now they just do individualized group training. Here's an example of our, our camp. Uh, this is a I think three or four years ago, or 2017, so three years ago, every summer we have a camp uh, for individuals with disabilities. Uh, it's a gym and swim program, and this is an example of how we kind of set up for that. Notice that we probably have 50 people in this gym. Here's a little bit of yoga. Here is an example of, uh, this is I think two or three years ago as well. So as you see here, we have different stations set up. Got the battle rope, but also using it for jumping. Adding more fitness in the past five years. This we had actually 10 years ago. I love this game where you just pull out the hula hoops and allow them to just toss as many beanbags as possible. They have to squat and hinge and pick up the beanbag and they also have to throw it. So those are two objectives in PE.
When these are nutrition bean bags, it's also a good time to max, uh, match maybe colors of foods or maybe prescribing you know, maybe carbohydrates or sugars in one and having and labels for them as well. Here's a stepper that we like to use, uh, the basketball nets. Uh, sometimes we don't have, uh, we're not able to get them down or they're not um, accessible for everyone. So sometimes we just shove the hula hoops in the bleachers. Uh, we definitely love to have racket sports and balloons. I think that's the best way to do that as far as getting um, individuals with disabilities to learn how to just handle the racket. Love using the scooters and getting people in the prone position. It's really good for back extension. It's really good for the legs, really good for the core. Um, and then here's an adaptation for somebody who um, needs maybe to sit down as they do the battle rope because it is a high exercise. So, you know, just congratulating them and a lot of these individuals don't do a lot of physical activity at home and just giving them a lot of praise for when they do it. And so just adapting it to their ability level. Here's an exa another example of the bike. So it looks like they're advancing over here. Okay, med ball throws making sure that he grabs it before it hits her feet. Let's go ahead and uh, get back to the pool, give you some more examples of what the pool is like. So typically we like to do some warm up stretches before we get into the pool. Anne was a really great uh, leader in that. She was also accredited as a uh, adapted aquatics coach. So she would, she knew really how to teach these individuals. She really helped me a lot. Okay, so not everyone's gonna be able to participate in this group or social game. Sometimes that's a little bit overstimulating for some individuals, or in this case, they're gonna be on their own. And this is one teacher working with one student. And it takes some time, so you have to be very patient. And sometimes, <laughs> in this case, you have to be the one that gets in first. And for the pool, yes, number one thing is you're the first one in and the last one out. So it might take him 20, 30 minutes just to get in the pool. But here's an example of him just getting in there. Okay, and for this individual, it might be a little bit harder for him to get in the pool for, than most people. So it might take 20, 30 minutes to get some people in the pool based on their behavior. So that's just something that's just part of, um, you know, the assessment process, the behavior process. And so what you're trying to do is just go one step at a time, check it off the box. So check off the box. So first task would be, you know, just changing in and out of your clothes, right? Second task would be putting your clothes on the bleachers. Third is to meet the lifeguard, you know, fourth would be to just get into the pool. Five would be to just start swimming laps. So we're at step five, you know, and it might take 40 minutes to get there for one person. It might take two minutes to get there for one, another person. Okay, we, we definitely had to share some of the lanes. And then here's an example of some students in the gym. So we would have in some labs, students in the gym and in the pool at the same time. So imagine me going up and down the stairs, checking out all, this, all these students. Uh, this is a typical day for me on a Wednesday and Friday. Okay, let's 
go on to the next one. I actually think this is a good shot right here of all the different groups, one, two, three, four, five different groups here working independently. And this is, this is inclusive physical activity because it's giving everyone the chance to kind of work together. The mentors are leading groups here in this case. So each mentor has three mentees in this class. So that goes to show that depending on your lab situation, you could have one mentee or you could have three. In this case, they had three. Here's an example of a student with cerebral palsy doing push-ups. Okay, I think we've seen that example before. This is an example of students with severe disabilities using ramps to bowl or to roll or to throw. So this would be an example of trying to adapt the curriculum or adapt the equipment for the curriculum. So the curriculum never changes. We're always teaching physical education. It's just how we adapt it. So this would be the same standards we'd apply for bowling, but there might just be more physical prompting and obviously more equipment needed. So this is actually bocce. If you've never played bocce, bocce is super fun. You need to play it. It's a really good outdoor activity. You can play at the beach. Good for walking. Okay, different options. And some students weren't, um, as you see here, we have um, had headphones on or um, uh, we have earmuffs on. This will help this individual with sensory processing. So in the gym, it might be too loud for the individual. So as you know, we have this hall outside of Hanover Gym. Some individuals are going to go out there and some of them are going to want to interact with media. In this case, their phone could be an iPad, could be a computer screen, and then that's going to help them stay on task with their mentor. And in this case, it would be one mentor per one mentee. So if an individual with a disability has a severe disability, we're going to make sure they get a one on one. If an individual with a disability has, an, has a mild intellectual disability, they can be partnered and teamed up with many people. In many cases, they don't need too much instruction. Um, they can do a lot of group activities. And you always want to promote group activities over isolated activities. But in this case, this is the least restrictive environment. And so that's what the team, that's what the term LRE means in special education. So some students like football. So this looks like a time where they kind of chose their own activities to perform. I'm always going to give you activities to teach, but then again, you're going to always create your own with your mentee. It's a good example of using the scooters. Let's see here. The battle rope. These are our interactive yoga boards. Uh, these interactive yoga boards, um, if you look under them, it will show you the picture. So it gives them a clear picture of what to do and it helps the mentor also teach the lesson. So I don't have to go over there and tell them what poses to teach because the poses are right there for them to learn. That's why it's really important to have paper cutouts for all of your stations that you teach whenever you instruct, no matter what the age level. Okay, I love this game. I just call, I just call this rollerball. These are great cooperative activities. You always want to try to find games that are cooperative, not competitive. Competitive uh, usually or typically leads to, um, uh, can lead to aggression, frustration, um, anxiety. 
And so we typically like to create more cooperative games. Um, yes, we will compete, we will play sports in that competition, but that those have rules that, you know, we talk about character development in sports, but when we're playing uh, just games like uh, warming up or working out, or like the games that we do in class, typically gonna be cooperative. So one objective for this might just be to be able to work together. So in this case, this mentor is trying to get these two mentees to work together. And they might not typically like to socially interact, but that's the mentor's job. Okay, so there's another example of the pool. Uh, this student here, um, it took him almost a whole semester to get into the pool. And then when he did, he would only stay next to the side. And this is his first time in the deep end. Okay, so you just kind of, you know, work with what they're willing to give. And a lot of times um, you could just want to be patient. So in this case, this individual wouldn't go in the middle of the lane and they, he wanted to stay on the side of the lane. And it wasn't until three years after we got him to swim in the middle of the lane because of his uh, anxiety and fears. So we can limit anxiety and fear by making things fun and we adapt everything. So um, here is an uh, example of where we adapt the Winter Olympics and we kind of have an ice skating uh, station where we have them slide on the pennies. Um, so we call them speed skills. Okay, so they pretend like they're skiing through. Um, as far as teaching individuals uh, hockey, we try to make sure sometimes we use maybe a little bit bigger of a ball so they can see it. Here's uh, Kyle in that instance where we talked about how he would be able to see it. Here's the uh, do you remember, do you know what this is? This is, let's see here. I think it, what is it, boom ball? No, it's not boom ball. I forget what it's called. So we got hockey. All right, I want to get to the, my favorite part, which is the bobsled, yes. Okay, so, you know, having fun, what we like to do in our labs. This is an example of really trying to get someone to move more. Uh, this individual um, typically won't stay in the gym that long. And when he does, um, he typically doesn't interact or move that much. So there's an example of us just trying to get him to move more. Uh, playing hockey, love playing hockey. Uh, definitely used to play a lot of hockey in the gym. And hopefully we'll get back to that point when we have students entering our gym again. Here's an example of some adaptive hockey progressions. I actually uh, presented this at NC Aford. Uh, this is the gym setup before. And so during Okay, I'll have different activities like move around in space without touching anything, keep the blade low. Okay, using uh, yarn balls actually for pucks instead of pucks using yarn balls or using like a, like a bean bag as well. This individual here is in a wheelchair and he's also a So just given lots of physical, lots of verbal cueing uh, when teaching hockey. Um, this is a very fun uh, day. And here's another way you can teach. So you don't have to use the hockey stick. If the individual wants to use their feet instead. So trying to get these two to play with each other here, just trying to keep the ball through the net. Oh, <laughs> 
So here's a healthy and unhealthy game where you're throwing the healthy food in the green hoop and the unhealthy food in the red hoop. Just another example of how we adapt. Here's another video of the pool. This video, uh, this video is from last year. Okay, so this was a uh, fire log, so they had to go get the logs and take it back to the campsite instead of the swim, get the log, take it back to their partner. Um, and these are just some of the games that we play in the pool. And then the last thing I'm going to show you is a video from the gym. And noticing that over the years, I've tried to use more pitchers. And I've tried to uh, make things a little bit more clear over the years for my students when they're at each station. So obviously you see here the, the bowling station. I started using more noodles. I started adding things like a tossing station here with the hula hoops. I have some bins over here uh, for Frisbee, just uh, more, more activities. So when they enter the gym, on a Saturday morning, they have things to do with their mentor that they've just met. So our Saturday programs are a little bit different than our labs. Our labs are a little bit more structured uh, because uh, we know who's coming and we have the same mentors and same mentees. On Saturday, what happens is we get random mentors, random volunteers, and we get um, a lot of the same participants, but some of them even change every week. So we just get a lots of new people each week. And what I like to do is I like to like create these types of stations that are just very forward and direct. So for this example, it's a four way um, a balloon game with some rackets and it's a cooperative game where they're trying to hit it to each other and keep it up off of the ground. And this just gives people a chance to kind of interact physically with each other uh, in the gym. And so this would be an example of our Saturday lab, which is a lot different than our, our labs uh, nowadays, right? Because our labs nowadays look like this. So this is what it looked like last year when we had both mentors and mentees without masks. We would start with our typical mobility. And for dynamic stretching, we started moving into like the hula hoop. So uh, giving people actual equipment instead of just using nothing. So obviously, you know, we try to use as much equipment as possible. And so this case, um, getting them warmed up, I'm showing them obviously here galloping. I'm having them gallop across the court. Let's see here, and I'm just kind of warming them up before we even get started. So this would be an example of me instructing them in class before my students started teaching the physical activities. So we go over dynamic stretching, warm up, mobility, breathing, and then we go over sports skills. So this would be an example of um, basketball or handball or any type of um, ball skills. Okay. So just kind of getting them to work with their partners, noticing that I am showing them. I'm teaching the class a cool down 
this is probably the beginning of the semester where I taught the class first, and then I would have you, the teacher, and you, the mentors, teach second. So this would be an example of just a, a mobility cool down, some cat and cows here. Or, oh no, it looks like we're doing a fitness here. And then I think we get to the cool down here. So it looks like I'm cooling them down after fitness. So that's how I kind of ran lab. I would start off with mobility, breathing, do some dynamic stretching, maybe use the hula hoops, maybe do a dance, maybe play a fun game, go into some sports skills, and then go into fitness skills, and then go back to the mobility and breathing. So that's kind of how I like to structure all my classes. That way we can play different sports, we can do different fitness activities, we can do different narrative games, but we know the sequence and order of all those things. We typically, you know, start with a warm up, dynamic stretching or dance or fun game. Maybe it's a narrative game and then we play some type of sport and then we perform some type of fitness activities, whether it's resistance training, maybe it's agility, maybe it's strength, maybe it's balance, maybe it's yoga, and then go into our cool down. Okay. So these are just examples of um, what class is like uh, when there is no COVID and people aren't wearing masks. So um, hopefully you get a lot of, um, I guess, information from this as, how, as far as what labs used to look like. And um, hopefully you'll kind of gain appreciation for uh, having face-to-face -face classes uh, from here on out and, and working with people face-to-face. So never underestimate um, all those interactions that you've had and hopefully uh, you've learned some new adapted physical activities in this video and hopefully you enjoyed it. All right, everyone have a great day.